Let's talk forgiveness. We have built into our bodies a sense of justice. We might feel this when the beverage we paid for comes back to us and it's 90% ice and only 10% actual substance. Or when we hear that the Houston Astros apparently were cheating throughout their entire 2017 World Series season. Even if we don't care all that much about baseball or coffee, these things can make us angry because well, if people are cutting corners just because they find clever ways of doing so, then any sense of trust or stability seems to erode. And injustice seems to rule the day. And then to forgive in such a situation, well, that just feels like letting the offender go unpunished. Indeed, our internal sense of justice is a gift from God. We are not meant to just let injustice run all over us or our neighbor. Recall that last Sunday, Jesus taught us how to correct someone who sins against us. This is because if somebody is corrected well and they have the humility to receive it, well, then they can grow from that mistake. The responsibility, then, lies on us as sinners to repent, yes. But it also lies on us as victims. Surprisingly, the same is true this week. Jesus again lays responsibility on the victim, the offended person, in that when we are sinned against, not only should we pray about perhaps correcting the person who sinned against us, but we're also invited to take upon ourselves the difficulty of forgiving that person. These two things are not mutually exclusive. And so why, we might ask, would our Lord be placing more weight on the person's shoulders who is hurt? in these situations. Well, lest we think we're misreading these passages, let's take a closer look. You wicked servant, we heard. And why did the king say this? Not because the servant owed a huge debt, but because of his unforgiveness. Surprising, perhaps. Because, well, we expect that if God is ever going to call us a wicked servant, surely it would be because of something that we did to hurt somebody else. And yet in this passage, the issue isn't just the debt. It's the lack of forgiveness. Now, what you might have missed while hearing this passage is one of the most important details that is necessary to understand this gospel. Because in this translation of the passage, which as you know, right, the, the gospels were written in Greek and so it's translated, so there's multiple different translations. Well, in this translation we heard, a debtor was brought before him who owed the king a huge amount. And then later, a fellow servant was brought before him who owed a much smaller amount. And so you can think, okay, like I get the juxtaposition, one amount was greater than the other, get the point, right? Well, if we go to the actual Greek, we find that there's a lot more going on behind this story. Because when it says a huge amount, what it actually means is 100 million denarii, where a denarius was the equivalent of one day's wage. And the much smaller amount is only 100 denarii, where the denarius, again, is one day's wage. 
So for all of you math whizzes out there, what this means is that the first servant's debt, in order to be paid off, would have taken 2,739 years of labor. The second servant would have taken three months. Clearly, the distinction is between an impossible amount and a very possible debt. This is then meant to change our perspective on forgiveness, because in this parable, all of us are the first servant. Let me ask you this. Who here has never sinned? Anybody? Who here has never lied? Never stolen? Never hurt anybody else? Never been prideful? Selfish? Never abused your free will in choosing something you knew full well to be wrong and then chose it anyways. Anybody? I'm implicating myself here, of course, too. Now another question. Who here chose to come into existence? Seems like a silly question, but again, who here can cause their own heart to continue beating at every moment? Well, I'm not suggesting that God, rather than our parents or our brain stems, are necessarily the immediate causal relationship explanation to these questions. I'm simply making the point that our life is indeed pure gift. Just as we cannot choose to make our own heartbeat, so too we cannot choose to make God sustain us in existence at every moment of every day. And so, when we take that gift of existence, that gift of everything that we have, everything that we are, which we did not earn, did not choose, did not deserve, we take that gift of our life and use it to introduce evil into the world around us, what we're essentially doing is amassing an infinite debt that we cannot repay. Naturally, our first reaction to encountering this reality of our sinfulness would be to presume, well then, surely all that God sees in me is a wicked servant. But remember what we said earlier. The king doesn't call the repentant servant wicked. He calls the unforgiving servant wicked, because he forgives that 100 million denarii. He forgives that unrepayable debt. Jesus came not to condemn, but to set us free from our sin. And in so doing, he recreates us anew as children of the Most High. So. What then are we to do when our brother or sister sins against us? Should we begin to choke them and demand that they repay what they took from us? No. We should pray, in the name of Jesus, I forgive for whatever it might be. Because remember, even what they might have taken from us was never ours to begin with. It was a gift from God. And he who transformed death into new life on the cross, he has proven to us that he can recreate any wound, any debt, any death into life anew. All we do by holding on to unforgiveness is to fulfill the rest of this parable, 
Jesus said that the king sent the, unforgiven, the unforgiving servant off to the torturers. And we might think, wow, that's, uh, that seems a little cruel uh, to have something like that happen. Until we realize that, well, when we who have been forgiven are unforgiving, we do nothing but hurt ourselves. We can cling to revenge as if it could heal that wound or that it could bring back what was lost. And all we do in being unforgiving is giving further power over our minds and over our hearts to that person who offended us. In essence, when we do not forgive our brother or sister from our heart, we hand ourselves over to the torturer. The torture that is to bear on our shoulders a grievance or a grudge that we do not need to bear. Forgiveness is painful, true, but unforgiveness is torture. The good news is that just as Jesus sets us free from sin, so too can he set us free from unforgiveness. And in this way, he can recreate us anew.